So before we start our discussion, let us just have a quick recap of what we have studied on our previous discussion. So from our previous meeting, we have learned that bridge engineering is an engineering discipline branching from civil engineering that involves the planning, design, construction, operation, maintenance, and rehabilitation of bridges to ensure safe and effective transportation of vehicles, people, and goods. So last meeting, we have, we have clarified that bridge engineering and bridge design are actually two different courses because bridge engineering is actually a broader course than uh, the bridge design because in bridge design we are just focusing on the design of the bridge how to design the superstructure the substructure and the other parts of the bridge while in bridge engineering we we are concerned we usually deal with everything about bridges so bridge engineering encompasses everything that is that is what we have learned from our last meeting we have learned that bridge engineering uh, is not only about uh, bridge design but it's about planning design construction operation maintenance and rehabilitation of bridges not only design but it includes the planning the construction, the operation, the maintenance, and the, the rehabilitation of bridges. So that is what we, that is one of the things that we have learned from our last meeting. Another thing that we have learned from our last discussion are the different parts of a bridge. So we have learned that there are actually different parts of a bridge and there are, there are general terms that are usually used to describe these several parts of a bridge and the first general term that we have studied last discussion is the superstructure so what do we mean when we say superstructure so superstructure comprises all the health, all the components of a bridge above the supports so superstructure is the part of the bridge that are or that is being supported by the supports and those supports are actually called substructure substructure consists of all elements required to support the superstructure so those are the two general terms that we usually use to describe the different parts of a bridge superstructure these are this, this this is the part or these are the parts of a bridge that are being supported by the substructure the substructure is the work uh, substructures are the part are the parts of a bridge that are used to support the superstructure and then we also learned from last meeting that aside from these two general terms just to describe the parts of a bridge we also learned from last meeting uh, the, the terms appurtenances and site related site related features so what are these appurtenances so when we say appurtenance appurtenance is any part of the bridge or bridge site that is not a major structural component yet serves some purpose in the overall functionality of the structure so this is this appurtenances are actually not 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 a major structural component of the bridge or the bridge site although still they still uh, serve some purpose in the with respect to the overall functionality of the structure like for example the guardrails or the traffic barriers or the bridge barriers and so on and so forth so these are not actually the major appurtenances and rights and sites site related features are not actually part of the bridge or should I say not actually a major part of the bridge with respect to the structural component of the bridge but still they serve they still serve some purpose with respect to the overall functionality of the bridge 
another thing that we have learned from our discussion last meeting are the different uh, types of bridge structure. So we have learned that there are actually different types of bridge structure. And those are slab on girder, one-way slab, steel and concrete box girder, cable stayed, suspension, steel and concrete arch, and lastly, truss. So these are the different types of a bridge structure. So the, the, the decision on which type of, of bridge structure will be used for a particular highway bridge site are actually dependent on several, uh, several factors that we have discussed last meeting. And one of those is the span, the required span of the bridge. So if we are talking about short to medium span, we can use slab on girder. If we are concerned with with a bridge site, with a highway bridge site, with a short span only, we can economically use one-way slab type. And then if we are if our highway bridge site uh, requires longer span, we can use steel and concrete box girder, cable state, suspension, steel and concrete arch, as well as truss type of bridge structure. Although truss type can also be used on short to medium span bridges. So these are the things that we have learned from our last or previous discussion. So for this meeting, our intended learning outcome for this discussion are this. At the end of the discussion, the students will be able to, number one, state the principal categories of fund source. Number two, explain the different types of design standards. Number three, explain the importance of site inspection and site survey. And lastly, explain the importance of physical testing and the different methods to conduct it. So, uh, as you have seen before, our, our lesson for today will revolve around project inception. So, before we go on or before we move on to the actual design, planning, and construction of bridges or bridge structures, it's worth it to know first how these projects, how these bridges are actually conceived. It's worthy to know first how these projects are, are actually started. So in order for us to achieve that goal, in order for us to have a knowledge how projects like bridge structures are being started, how they are being conceived, uh, we will try to discuss these intended learning outcomes for this discussion, we will try to to uh, familiarize ourselves with the principal categories of fund source, and then uh, we will try to familiarize ourselves as ourselves as well to the different types of design standards used in the in the design and planning of bridge structures, as well as let's also have a basic knowledge on the importance of site inspection and site survey before actually starting to design, plan, and construct a bridge. And lastly, let us also uh, know the importance of physical testing and the different methods to conduct it. So these are our goals for this discussion. So without further ado, let us address our first goal, which is for you to be able to state the principal categories of fund source. In any project, especially bridge structure projects, before the planning and design as well as the construction starts, there is this stage that is what we call the project inception, wherein the whole project is being conceptualized by the, uh, the whole team of that certain project. And before the start of this design, the planning and the construction, 
there are several important issues that concern the bridge engineer prior to comment, commencement of design. Before any design can begin, there is the issue concerning how bridge projects are selected and funded. Then there is the issue that pertains to the standards and references that an engineer utilizes during design. Finally, when design begins in earnest, an engineer must determine the types of field data and in the case of a rehabilitation project, record data are required to commence and eventually complete the work. So before the construction or should I say before the design planning and the construction of any project, especially a bridge structure commences, again, just like what I've said, there is this stage, which is what we call the project inception wherein the, the whole project is being conceptualized and the, the important issues are being, uh, being addressed first before the start of the actual planning and design. So these issues are usually uh, with respect to the fund or the sources of fund that the, the team the, the team of that particular project will will uh, will be using to to fund the whole project. So that's a, an important issue that must be addressed first before the start of any project, especially a bridge structure project. We have to specify first. We have to know first what will be the source of fund in order for us to to provide the needs of our project so that we can uh, we can uh, realize we can put into realization the the project that we are conceptualizing so there are actually different sources of fund that we usually uh, use to provide the needs the monetary needs of a certain project and then another issue that the design team, or should I say that the whole team of a project uh, needs to address is what standard or what standards and references that they have to, to use uh, or utilize during the design of the particular project. So there are different standards and references that we have that we are using in the industry. And actually these standards and references are usually, uh, usually varies from region to region or from project to project. So with that, with that problem, with that issue, the design, the, the whole team must address first what standard, what particular standard or references that they will have to refer in order to design the whole project properly. And then lastly, uh, the types of field data that the, the team must collect first uh, is also an issue before the commencement of the uh, design because the design cannot commence, the design cannot start if there is there are no sufficient field data that are gathered and this field data from the term itself are usually gathered or collected from the mm -hmm. highway bridge site itself. So that issue must be addressed first before the whole design process, the whole design phase can start as well as if, if, if for the case of a rehabilitation project, there must be a record data that must be gathered first to, to aid the rehabilitation design of the project. So when we say record data, these are usually a record or that or a record of the history of a certain project that needs to be rehabilitated. And this record data can can aid, can help to the design of that rehabilitation project. So all in all, before any design in any plan or any construction can commence. This stage, which is what we call the project inception, 
must be addressed first. The issues regarding the fonts, the standards and references, and the field data must be addressed first before the design can commence. So now let us address first the first issue that a bridge engineer usually deals, deals with before the commencement of the design, planning, and construction of a bridge structure project, which is the project funding. The design and rehabilitation of highway bridges is an activity that has considerable financial demands. With such huge costs associated with transportation projects, the obvious question is, where does all this money come from? Funding for highway projects in general and bridge projects comes from a variety of sources and varies from region to region. So the first issue or concern that a bridge engineer must deal with before, the, before he or she can start or commence the design, planning, and construction of a bridge structure is the project funding. So we, so we have to address first where where will the fund will come from? So usually resources of fund varies from region to region or with respect to that particular project. So the, the, the sources of funds usually varies from one project to another as well as it uh, they are usually different from region to another region. So we will enumerate here the five principal categories of fund source. And the first one is the user base. So this is one of the sources of fund of a bridge structure project. User fees, like uh, for example, taxes imposed on the users of the highway system, imply funds generated through traditional highway related fees such as vehicle registration, uh, gasoline taxes, and tracking fees. So user fees, just like what I've said, this is usually one of the sources of fund for a highway bridge project. So when we say user fees, these are usually taxes imposed on the users of the highway system. So if you are a user of the highway system, so like for example, if you if you own a car and you usually use to travel on that particular highway highway system, you are uh, included to this uh, users that we are talking about. So there is this fee that 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 is usually imposed on those users of a particular highway system just to be able to fund or provide for the needs of that particular highway. So this can be in the form of vehicle registration, gasoline taxes, and tracking fees. Another form of user fee is the toll road. Toll facility authorities have the advantage of a relatively precise form of user funding so they can afford a rapid and high level of maintenance compared to other transportation departments. However, toll roads are typically restricted access highways that result in limited availability to users. One drawback to toll roads is the cost of implementing and maintaining toll collection facilities like this one. You know, so usually so you usually see this. These are actually uh, usually in the entrance of a particular restricted access highway, which is a which is actually a toll gate. So this is where the the tolls are collected. Electronic toll collection has significantly reduced the operating costs of toll facilities. Furthermore, by not requiring the vehicle to stop. The public's, the public's acceptance of toll facilities has increased in recent years. So aside from vehicle registration, gasoline taxes, and tracking fees, another form of 
user face can be in the form of uh, of toll road. So in a toll road, there is usually a toll gate like this one, wherein the the authorities for that particular highway or bridge or highway system in general uh, collects the fund, the money, the user fee, or simply the toll out from the users of the particular highway system. So in general, it is the users that provides the fund for the uh, maintenance as well as the, the needs of a particular highway system. So the, the, the maintenance or, or, or should I say that the, the, the source of fund of a particular highway system uh, will be more dependent on the fees generated by the users. Although uh, these toll roads are typically uh, restricted access highways. So therefore, uh, there is usually there is no uh, 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 too much amount of users that can use or access these highways because usually these these highways that has that have toll roads are typically restricted access highways. Therefore, there are uh, there is a limited availability to users that can result to low user fee collection. So that's actually one of the disadvantage of having toll roads on typically, or should I say, disadvantage of having toll roads on restricted access highways. There, were, there will be a limited availability of users for that particular highway. Therefore, uh, there will be a reduction or decrease in the user fees or toll fees that can be collected from the users because there are limited users in the first place because the highway uh, is usually restricted restricted uh, access highway. So another disadvantage of having these toll roads is the cost of implementing and maintaining toll collection facilities like this one. So, so obviously for 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 the fees to be collected from the users in a toll gate or toll road like this, uh, there must be a manpower that will actually collect the, the fee from the users of that particular toll road. So there will be a, a, a or should I say, there will be an additional cost because there will be a manpower needed there, there must be an employee needed to collect for the fees from the users of a particular highway system or toll road. Although nowadays, electronic toll collection has significantly reduced the operating cost of toll facilities like this one because uh, since there is already an electronic toll collection system, manpower can be Reduce since there is actually no need to have a uh, to have someone to collect the fees because everything uh, is already done electronically. So the the fees are already being paid electronically. So there is no need to have someone to actually collect the fees from the users of a part of a particular toll road. So in addition to that. Uh, this electronic toll collection uh, results to uh, to an advantage to the users of a highway system because uh, since there is no need to collect by a there is no need to collect the the fees by a but by a by a manpower or by a, by an employee. Therefore, the the vehicles uh, don't need to stop on the toll gates just to be able to collect the fees from them because everything is done electronically al electronically already so the users of the toll roads uh, don't need anymore to stop on the toll gate just to pay for tolls or for 
for toll fees or for their, their user fees. Because again, everything uh, is collected electronically. So they, they don't need to stop on the toll gate. And because of that, because of that advantage of this electronic system, the, the public's acceptance of toll facilities has increased in recent years. So you can see here, this is actually a toll road with a toll collection facility here that uh, that is already uh, doing electronic toll collection. So you can see the, the vehicles uh, accessing the road. Uh, they 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 don't need anymore to stop on the toll gate or just to just to be able to collect the fees from them, so they can just go ahead uh, and don't need to stop anymore on the toll call, uh, toll facility because everything is being done electronically, especially the collection of user fees. So user fees are one of the principal source of fund for a particular uh, highway project. So the, the source, I mean the fund that, that will uh, sustain the, the project can be, can be collected from users themselves. So another source of fund for providing the needs of a certain transportation project, a highway or bridge project, can be coming from non-user fees. Funds obtained from sales taxes, income taxes, or other general fund sources are known as non-user fees. So these are, uh, are uh, again, another source of fund that can provide for the needs of a certain transportation project. The, the fees that can be generated from the non-users of a certain highway system. So when we say non-users, so these are the people that are not directly using a particular highway or bridge project. So the fees that can be generated from these non-users can be in the form of sales taxes, income taxes, and other general fund sources. So this fees that can be collected from these non-users of a certain highway system or of a certain highway project can be used to provide for the needs or maintenance or other needs of a certain highway or bridge project. So those are non-user fees. Fees generated from people that are not directly using a certain highway or bridge project. So they, the, the, the fees can be generated in the form of sales taxes or income taxes. And this fees again, this non-user fees, can be used to provide the needs of a project, of a highway project or bridge project. At certain times, governments may invest extra money in highway projects to stimulate the economy during recessions. History has shown that this type of spending program can help promote economic recovery and produce long-term benefits to the regional economy, provided that the funds make their, make their way into infrastructure projects. So these non-user fees that are collected uh, usually are being used by governments and they usually invest this the extra money the governments uh, usually invest extra money in highway projects uh, to stimulate the economy not only during recession but in general uh, the, the government uh, use this non-user fees that they collected from sales taxes and income taxes and invest them uh, in infrastructure projects to with the, with the purpose of stimulating the economy. As, as you all know, in our country, in the Philippines, we have this build, build, build program by our government wherein our government is investing extra money on its infrastructure projects with the purpose of stimulating the economy. So some of the build, build, build projects that are undergoing uh, feasibility study is the Bataan Cavite Interlink Bridge. This is a bridge. 
is a cable state bridge that will connect Bataan and Cavite. And then, so, so this uh, particular, particular build, build, build project is presently in feasibility uh, study stage. Uh, still in feasibility study stage. So this particular build, build, build project is still in feasibility study stage. So another build, build, build program of our government is the Estrella Pantalion Bridge. And this is uh, uh, in ongoing construction. So this Estrella Pantalion Bridge will connect Makati and Mandaluyong. So it can reduce the travel time of the users of of, uh, or should I say, this will reduce the travel time of uh, uh, travelers on the area. So these uh, infrastructure projects where the government invests extra money that, uh, that are generated from non-user fees can stimulate economy. So in what way? Like for example, if I am a businessman, if I am uh, an investor, and I'm planning to to build a concrete mix plant, say for example in Cavite, and then I'm I'm still hesitating whether I will pursue on building my concrete mix plant on Cavite or not. So if I will, if I know that there is an infrastructure project like this one, the interlink bridge that will connect Cavite and Bataan, I can see that. This interlink bridge, this infrastructure project of our government will significantly reduce my operating costs because like for example, if I have projects, obviously if I have projects in Cavite, I can easily deliver concrete mix on any client within the uh, vicinity of Cavite. But like for example, if I have a client in Bataan, the tendency is I, I have to uh, travel uh, uh, a longer distance just to be able to go in Bataan, just to be able to supply concrete mix on my client that is located in Bataan. Because if you are familiar with the topographical location of Bataan and Cavite, they are actually separated by a body of water. So they are not actually connected. So if you want to travel from Cavite to Bataan, or vice versa from Bataan to Cavite, you need to go around you have to pass by on many cities, uh, many cities or provinces, just to go from one uh, uh, one place to the other, just to go from Bataan to Cavite. So that is the that's, that is the problem of of having a concrete mix plant located in Cavite, and then you have you have a client that you have to supply that is located in Bataan. But if there is an, an infrastructure project like this one, the Matan Cavite Interlink Project, uh, Interlink Bridge. This can significantly reduce the the operating costs of a businessman or investor with a with a concrete mix plant located in Cavite, because the the Interlink Bridge will greatly reduce the fuel consumption, or should I say, in general, the operating costs of this particular businessman or investor because uh, he, he, can, he, he, he doesn't need anymore to go around just to be able to supply from Cavite to Bataan because there is already a direct connection that will directly provide a way to provide uh, or to supply concrete mix coming from Cavite to Bataan. So this particular infrastructure project of our, of our government can greatly reduce the operating cost of a uh, businessman or investor. So, so, so in, in that case, this will attract more the investor himself. So it, this will help the investor to decide whether to, uh, to, to build, to actually build or construct his uh, concrete mix plant in Cavite or not. Because uh, uh, having this infrastructure project, uh, knowing that there is a in, there is an infrastructure project that can locate Cavite and Bataan, this will attract that particular investor or businessman to to pursue or to proceed uh, constructing his business, his concrete mix plant, because he knows that this will help on reducing his operating costs, especially fuel 
consumption when delivering concrete mix because it doesn't need anymore to go around just to be able to supply from Cavite to Bataan because there's there, because there is already an interlink bridge that connects Cavite and Bataan. So that that is one example of how uh, the 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 non-user phase that are used or invested in infrastructure in infrastructure projects can stimulate economy. That is one example of uh, how can this uh, non-user phase that are invested in infrastructure projects can generate uh, income in a certain location. That is one example of how it can stimulate the economy on a particular location. So again, just a recap, non-user fees are fees generated from uh, from people that are not directly using the, the infrastructure project. So again, this can be in the form of sales taxes or income taxes. And this fees, this non-user fees, can be invested by governments uh, on infrastructure projects to stimulate the economy to attract investors to attract businessmen to to invest their business on a particular location so another source of fund to provide the needs of an infrastructure project are the special benefit fees a special benefit fee is a tax place on those individuals usually developers who benefit from a new or rehabilitated highway system. The special benefit fee provides a source of revenue for improving or expanding facilities to meet the needs of a growing community. Sometimes this takes the form of an impact fee that calls for developers to pay for part of a highway expansion or make a direct, uh, a direct cash contribution to meet a new development's highway-related needs. So, when we say special benefit fees, these are actually uh, 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 can be in uh, can be in a form of a tax placed on those individuals, usually developers, that are in some way or another benefit from a new or rehabilitated highway system. Like for example, the businessmen on a particular location like Binondo Intramuros, uh, like around the vicinity of Binondo Intramuros Bridge or the BGC Ortigas Center Link Road Project. Let's say for example, we have a condominium developer uh, located in BGC. So the condominium building is located in BGC. So as we all know, at a tenant uh, usually uh, needs to know if the condominium building is accessible to essential places like schools, markets, churches, or other essential facilities. So that's one of the criteria of a tenant or an applicant for, for him or her to decide whether to pursue an application in a condominium building in a certain place. So if we have an infrastructure project like this one, the BGC Ortega Center Link Road Project, this infrastructure project can provide an access to the condominium building to these different essential places like the uh, supermarkets, uh, the schools, churches, hospitals, etc. So in that in that in that indirect way, the infrastructure project or should I say that the condominium developer uh, benefits from the infrastructure project because because of this infrastructure project, because of the link road project, for example, tenants or applicants of condominium buildings uh, increase or increases in uh, number. So uh, with that increase in uh, number of uh, tenant applicants, Therefore, the condominium developer also gains additional profit because of this particular infrastructure project. Because this project gives the condominium building an easy access to essential places that results to the attraction of 
more and more tenants or applicants that will again eventually result to a gain or additional gain in profit by the condominium developer. So in one way or another, in 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 just an indirect way, the condominium developer benefits from the infrastructure project itself. Therefore, a special benefit fee can be imposed to the condominium developer. So it can be a form of, it can come in a form of a tax or an impact fee or, or simply a direct cash contribution. So that is special benefit fee. Another common source of fund for an infrastructure project or transportation project is private financing. One form of private financing is for developers to donate to the transportation department in return for changes in zoning, building codes, etc. Privatization is another form of private financing that relies on not only private funding, but also private maintenance of constructed facilities. At one end of the spectrum, privatization allows for a private organization to entirely fund, build, and maintain a public facility, such as a transportation project. Transportation projects, however, often require the developer to perform activities such as right-of-way acquisition, environmental assessment, and so on, that public agencies are better suited to handle. In response to these agencies, uh, in response to this, agencies have implemented a privatization scheme known as PPP or Private Public Partnership. So again, just like what I've said, another uh, source of fund for a transportation project is the private financing. So from the term itself, uh, we can easily see that in private financing, obviously the main source of fund is is a private entity, usually developers or private companies. So private financing can be, or private financing can come in the form of a donation to the transportation department. And other form of private financing is what we call the PPP or the private public partnership. This is actually a privatization scheme wherein a private entity will uh, will coordinate or will will partner to a public agency just to be able to construct a particular transportation project so in ppp as the term itself uh, uh, shows there is again a private entity with with a with a particular project, say for example, a transportation project that, say for example, needs right of way acquisition, environmental assessment, etc. So, so uh, at some point, private entities are not that good on this particular processes, the right of, right of way acquisition, environmental assessment, etc. So, but but uh, public agencies are actually used to this kind of processes. Uh, public agencies are naturally responsible for these processes, right of, way, right of way acquisition, environmental assessment. So because of that, private entities can uh, partner to a public agency to benefit from one another. So for example, uh, a public agency wants to construct a certain transportation project for the benefit of the citizens of a particular location or place, but they they at some point they lack they lack a source of fund. So the fund can come from a private entity. So therefore they will be partnered with a private entity. And then in return, this private entity can benefit from that particular transportation project for some period of time. So one one example, one good example of a PPP project in our country, in the Philippines, is the 
Cebu Cordova Link Ex uh, Cebu Cordova Link Expressway or CCLEX. So this is an ongoing project of our government that is included in the Build 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 program. So this particular project is actually a PPP project wherein a private entity uh, uh, is responsible to entirely fund, build, and maintain this particular public facility which connects Cebu and Cordova. So in a PPP project, usually a private entity, just like what I've said, a private entity usually entirely fund, build, and maintain a particular transportation project or infrastructure project uh, for a certain period of time, say for example, 20 years. And then after that time, after the private entity uh, already gained enough profit to, to get back the capital that the private entity have uh, used, to, to construct the transportation project, the, the ownership and operation of the transportation project will be transferred to the public agency after that particular period of time, like for example, another uh, after 20 years. So within the 30 years, uh, I mean within the 20 years, the private entity will operate and maintain the, the particular public uh, project and then after that period of time, the ownership, the operation, and maintenance will be transferred to the public agency. So in that way, the private entity and the public agency will be benefited from each other. The private entity can gain profit from the transportation project. And in return, the public agency will benefit in, in, in such a way that it can provide a, an infrastructure project to its uh, citizens. So that is uh, that is one example of private financing. That is an example of how private entities finance uh, finance a particular transportation project. By the way, we have we have actually a website wherein you can see all of the uh, PPP projects that are already constructed or ongoing in our country, in the Philippines. So you can check that particular website if you want to know the different PPP projects uh, already constructed or ongoing construction in our country. I, I believe LRT1 extension, the Kavit extension, is again another example of uh, a PPP project. So we're in a private, private entity uh, partner to the uh, public agencies to a certain public agency so that is again uh, one privatization uh, form of private financing last principal category of fund source is the debt financing that financing usually through revenue bonds offers a pay-as-you-go approach to financing highway projects. This method has the advantage of providing highway departments with immediate access to funds that can be used on major projects in a timely fashion. An obvious danger would be in an agency's overborrowing leaving transportation departments with a shortfall in covering maintenance needs. So this is again another source of fund for providing the needs of a transportation project. So from the term itself, then debt financing, uh, it can easily be manifested that the, the, the finances, the, the fund that is being used to provide the needs of a transportation project uh, will be coming from uh, borrowing a certain amount of money from a loaning uh, loaning body like what our DPWH or local government uh, did on this particular project so uh, if you will visit the website of DPWH you can see this news wherein it is uh, stated there that the DPWH and the ADB the Asian Development Bank had a memorandum of uh, understanding 
uh, wherein the DPWH will be applying for a loan from ADB to, to fund the construction of three iconic bridges crossing Marikina River, namely the J. Perizal Lopez Haina Bridge, the Marcos Highway St. Mary Bridge, and the Kabayani Katipunan Avenue Extension Bridge. So as you can see here, the, our local agency uh, finances or will be financing the construction and uh, development of this of this uh, three iconic bridges by by using <clears throat> by using debt financing, wherein they are applying for a loan in a loaning body like the Asian Development Bank. So that is one example of debt financing. So in that way, uh, the loaning uh, body. Uh, will provide immediate access to funds to the local agency for them to immediately commence the particular transportation or high or infrastructure project. Although that although that financing has its own disadvantages or drawback because uh, in the case where in the agency uh, committed what we call over borrowing, where in the borrowed money or the loan fund uh, is uh, allocated only for the construction of the project itself, neglecting the need for a maintenance fund. So there can be what we call a shortfall with respect to covering the maintenance needs of a particular transportation project if there is uh, an overborrowing that uh, that was committed by the agency. So if the funds are not allocated properly all throughout the the realization of the project, the tendency will be there can have there will be a there might be a shortfall in uh, with respect to the funds needed for maintenance needs of that particular transportation or infrastructure project. So that is the last uh, category of fund source that are usually uh, used to, to fund or to provide for the needs of a particular infrastructure or transportation project. So we are now done addressing our first goal, which is for you to be able to state the principal categories of fund source. So now let's move on on addressing our second goal for this discussion, which is for you to be able to explain the different types of design standards. The design of a highway bridge, like most any other civil engineering project, is dependent on certain standards and criteria. Naturally, the critical importance of highway bridges in a modern transportation system would imply a set of rigorous design specifications to ensure the safety and overall quality of the constructed project. So like any other uh, engineering project for that matter, the design of highway bridge, like, the, like any other project, requires to, to refer on certain standards and criteria. Therefore, familiarization with the different types of, of design standards that are used in the design of a highway bridge is a must in order for us to be able to understand or to fully understand how to design a highway bridge. So we have to familiarize ourselves to the different design standards that are being referred when, whenever we design a highway bridge. Usually, the more important a highway projects uh, a, a highway project is the more rigorous design specification is needed to ensure the safety and over, overall quality of that particular highway bridge project so meaning uh, if we uh, if we have a highway project that has uh, a critical importance in a particular location therefore it can uh, imply that there are numerous 
uh, design specifications that are needed to be consulted and referred to just to be able to ensure its safety and uh, overall quality so that we have to uh, you, so that we can meet the 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 needed or the required safety and overall quality of that particular critical important highway bridge so there are actually uh, uh, two types of design standards that we will study on this discussion the first is the general specifications general specifications are an overall design code covering most structures in each transportation system so when we say general specification these are actually uh, a set of uh, instructions or specifications uh, that are usually used to guide a particular uh, design and construction of a uh, particular transportation system so these are actually just a set of guidelines to, to ensure that safety and overall quality will be met in a particular design of a transportation system in the united states bridge engineers have used ashtos e standard specifications for highway bridges or ashtos lrft bridge design specifications depending on when the bridges are designed and the state in which the bridges are located so this is the ashto lrft bridge design specifications 2012 so this this is uh, actually usual this is usually the the code that uh, that is being referred to in the united states whenever whenever they design uh, bridges in a similar fashion canadian bridge engineers utilize the csa bridge design codes and bridge and british designers use euro codes in the philippines DPWH Bureau of Designs Design Guidelines Criteria and Standards DGCS Volume 5 Bridge Design is used in the design of bridges. So this is the DGCS Volume 5 Bridge Design that were uh, uh, made by DPWH Bureau of Design uh, Department. So this is usually the the design code that we referred to whenever we design uh, horizontal structures in the Philippines. Before we are using NSCP, uh, NSCP Volume 2 uh, as our reference whenever we design horizontal structures. Although the, the problem there was the Volume 2 of the NSCP uh, was, uh, was not consistently uh revise through the year so it it does not undergo periodic revision and updates that's why we no longer use the previous versions of the nscp volume 2 so for now we are mainly re mainly referring to the dgcs volume 5 bridge design for the design of bridges well the dgcs actually has uh, six volumes and the fifth volume is all about bridge design so that is the volume of the dgcs that we will constantly referring to that we will be constantly referring uh, whenever we design a bridge in the philippines in general countries such as canada and the united kingdom which have developed and maintained major highway systems for a great many years possess their own national or regional bridge standards as is the case with the euro codes many nations have accepted the ashto bridge design codes as the general code for the design of their bridges so you can see here that there are some com there are some countries that uh, have their own specifications or standards with respect to bridge design it's because they have the capacity or capability to to produce their own standards maybe they have uh, enough fund to to fund uh, research and development on their on their country that's why they can produce their own standards 
Although some countries like the Philippines uh, generally adopted the Ashto Bridge design, which is this, uh, as our uh, guideline or as, a, as our guide in our local code. So our DGCS, if you will try to look uh, on the DGCS, Volume 5 Bridge, Bridge Design, you can see that uh, it has adopted the specifications of Ashto, Ashto LRFD Bridge Design specifications. So there are some countries that have their own specifications and there are some countries like the Philippines that, uh, that just adopted the uh, Ashto Bridge Design Code that is mainly used in the United States. Another type of design standard that we usually refer to whenever we design highway bridges or uh, any other project is the or are the material related design codes. Material design codes are those standards that pertain to bridge components constructed out of various engineering materials such as steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, timber, etc. So as you can see, as, 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 as you have seen on our previous meetings or discussions, there are different uh, parts of a bridge, there are different components of a bridge, and sometimes these uh, different components are made out of different materials such as steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, timber, etc. So these different materials uh, are usually referred to what we call material design codes or material related design code wherein this ma this material related design codes are actually standards that are usually being referred to whenever a, a certain material is being used in the design of a particular highway bridge project. So these materials can be a steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, or timber. So whenever you will use a particular material on a particular highway bridge project, say for example, concrete, you have to refer to, uh, to the to the governing material related design code pertaining to concrete material. General material specifications are put forth by the American Society for Testing and Materials or ASTM. So this is the logo of ASTM. So uh, we have different material related design codes for steel, different material design code for kiln for concrete, for precise concrete, for timber, although we have a general material specification uh, which, uh, which, have, which has uh, all of the specifications intended for steel, concrete, precise concrete, timber, and other, any other materials. And that can be found uh, from ASTM or the, from the American Society for Testing and Materials. So if you if you are familiar with ASTM, there 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 is there are actually a set of uh, material specifications that are specified by ASTM that pertains to different type of materials, starting from steel, concrete, precise concrete, timber, and any other material used in construction industry. So for the case of steel, for the case of the steel material. The American Institute of Steel Construction, or AISC, offers structural steel-related design and detailing manuals. So, for the case of steel, you can uh, that the the main uh, the main referral code is usually coming from the code made by AISC or American Institute of Steel Construction. So they have provided still related design and detailing manuals where ashto is comprised of professionals from member state transportation departments aisc standards are developed by steel fabricators design professionals and manufacturing companies so this is what uh, this is not something uh, something good about the aisc organization or the aic code in general so unlike the ashto 
uh, Ashto organization wherein they are comprised of professionals from member state transportation departments. Uh, the, the AISC, the uh, American Institute of Steel Construction, are uh, uh, referral codes. The AISC code are, are developed actually by steel fabricators, design professionals, and manufacturing companies themselves. So you can see here that the, the code, the AISC code, are, uh, is, is, is actually uh, built by not only design professionals, but all of the people that are related to steel, uh, steel material, like the steel fabricators and manufacturing companies. So all of their knowledge, together with the design professionals, are incorporated are incorporated in one design code, which is the AISC code made by the American Institute of Steel Construction. The principal AISC reference is the Steel Construction Manual, which is this. So you can see here the Steel Construction Manual, uh, 13th edition. So uh, I'm using, I, I, I usually use the Steel Construction Manual 13th edition or the AASC 360-05 because our local code, the NACP 2015, uh, is actually referred to the 13th edition of the Steel Construction Manual. So the chapter, chapter, uh, what chapter is still in NACP? I think it's chapter 5, if I'm not mistaken. So the chapter 5 still of the NSCP uh, 2015 uh, was actually referred to the AASC 360-05 Design Code, the 13th edition. AISC also publishes design information based on the allowable stress design or ASD method. But it is being phased out since most structural engineers recognize the advantage of LRFD over ASD. So the ASC organization not only publishes steel construction manual, but they also publish uh, some uh, other code about allowable stress design as well as LRFD. Although on this uh, nowadays, although nowadays, the ASD method or the allowable stress design method uh, is usually being phased out already because there is now an, ad, uh, an, uh, an, an advantage of using LRFT over ASD. So nowadays we are, we are more inclined on using LRFT method instead of ASD. The organization was founded in 1921 and six to advance the use of its material, like the steel, in construction projects. So as you can see on their logo, on the logo of AASC, it is founded uh, way back in 1921. So whenever we use steel as our construction material, we usually refer to the AISC as well as to the ASTM. So we can we can use these uh, two organizations whenever we want to refer, uh, whenever we use steel, steel as our construction material. Although the main governing body for steel material is the AASC, but you can, you can still see some specifications that coming from the ASTM, from the American Society for Testing and Materials. So for using concrete, as a construction material, the American Concrete Institute or ACI offers bridge engineers a set of standards in the analysis and design of reinforced concrete structures. So the governing organization that is uh, usually being referred to whenever we use concrete as our construction material is the American Concrete Institute or ACI. So they uh, they uh, provide us uh, a knowledge uh, about concrete. So they, they offer uh, a set of standards in the analysis and design of reinforced concrete 
structures. So they, they, the, the organization itself, the ACI, specializes on concrete. So they have their, they are conducting their own research and development to further improve our knowledge about the, the behavior of concrete materials. The principal design manual is building code requirements for structural concrete and commentary, which is this. So the I usually show the ACI 318M-14 because again this is the uh, reference edition of our local code, which is the NSCP 2015. So if you will try to look the chapter four concrete or structural concrete of our NSCP 2015. It was actually referred to ACI 318M-14, the, the edition of ACI uh, 318 uh, that was uh, published around 2014. So this is the edition that was referred to by our local code, NACB 2015, Chapter 4, Structural Concrete. The, the ACI uh, Detailing Manual is another important publication that provides the designer with guidelines on how to detail concrete structures and elements. So this is the this is the ACI detailing manual. Again, this is uh, this is being published by American Concrete Institute or ACI. This is actually the latest version or latest edition of the ACI detailing manual. So you can grab a copy of this from the website of the American Concrete Institute. So this particular manual is uh, usually being referred to if you want to know or have a knowledge on how to detail the, uh, the different concrete structures and elements. So the ACI 318M-14 is being referred to most of the time whenever we, have, we want to have a general knowledge or specific knowledge about concrete uh, itself. Uh, all the covered by ACI, pre-stress and precast concrete structures are also covered by the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute or PCI that publishes the PCI Design Handbook, which is this. So as I, as I mentioned before, although ACI specializes on concrete material, the, the pre-stress or precast concrete structures, all the covered already on the ACI, or the ACI codes, uh, there is actually another organization, which is the Precast Precess Concrete Institute or PCI, that specializes on precast and pre-stress concrete structures. So this organization uh, publishes the PCI design handbook that we can refer to whenever we, we design or construct precast or pre-stress concrete structures. So these are the different uh, referral codes or design standards that we can refer to whenever we use concrete. So the main governing uh, organization is the American Concrete Institute or ACI that publishes the, the building code requirements for structural concrete and commentary as well as the ACI detailing manual. So if you want to have a general specification about the use of concrete, you can refer to building code requirements for structural concrete. And if you want to have a knowledge or if you want to be familiar on how to detail concrete structures and elements, you can refer to ACI detailing manual. And again, although again, uh, all, uh, already, already covered in ACI, Although pre-stress or precast concretes are already covered by the ACI organization, again there is another organization which is the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute or PCI that publishes PCI Design Handbook that we can refer to whenever we are concerned with precast and pre-stress concretes. So those are the different material-related design codes whenever we use concrete as our construction material. So the other uh, construction material that we that we also have a uh, design code is the timber material. For bridge structures or structural components constructed out of timber, designer can refer to the timber construction manual 
published by the America Institute of Timber Construction or AITC and the National Design Specification for Wood Construction issued by the American Wood Council or AWC. So whenever we use timber as our construction material for our, our, our bridge structures, we can refer to this two codes, the timber, construction uh, the timber Construction Manual and the NDS, National Design Specification for Wood Construction. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, our local code, the NSCP 2015, if you will refer to Chapter, uh, uh, I believe, Chapter 6 of our NSCP 2015, all uh, you can see there that that chapter is all about wood or timber. So that particular part of our local code uh, is actually referred to NDS 2015 edition. So we have adopted the specifications provided by NDS, National Design Specification for Wood Construction 2015 edition, for our uh, local code NSCP 2015. Although some countries uh, or, uh, also refers, uh, refer to timber construction manual made by American Institute of Timber Construction. I don't know if this is the latest edition, the fourth edition. So you can just check, check that out if this is the latest edition of the timber construction manual. But overall, we usually use this uh, design standard as well as uh, this design standard whenever we use timber as our uh, material in our bridge structures. So those are the different material related design codes that we can refer to whenever we use uh, the, uh, a particular engineering material such as steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, timber, and other construction material. Although it is important to note that although these manuals offer information specific to various design materials, the ASHTO specifications still provides its own interpretation and guidelines for the use of the material in highway bridge structures. Normally, ASHTO specifications adopt the same design philosophies as those manuals. The ASHTO code, however, takes a more conservative approach so it may not necessarily use the identical equations as in other material design manuals. So as, as you can see, although, although we have uh, this different material related design codes for steel or concrete or precise concrete or timber, uh, we, we, uh, we have to to be clear that ASHTO specifications still has its own interpretation and guidelines for the use of the, the, uh, the different set of material that are usually used in highway bridge structures. So meaning we, 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 we must always refer to ASHTO specifications instead of those uh, different material related design codes whenever we design highway bridge structures. Although you have you don't have to worry because ASHTO specifications usually adopts uh, those different material related design codes uh, that are related to steel, concrete, pre-stressed concrete, or timber uh, materials. So ASHTO specifications uh, usually adopt those uh, same design philosophies as those different manuals for different engineering materials. Although ASHTO code, however, takes a more conservative approach so that uh, it can have its own approach whenever we deal with uh, designing so that it will not have an identical equation uh, with, with those uh, design manuals that we have in, uh, enumerated here. One must keep in mind that these material related codes deal mostly with building structural design. Therefore, they, they can only be used as references and for background information. Bridge engineers should always apply the actual code for their design. So just like what I've said, whenever we design highway bridge structures, we must always refer to the uh, ASHTO code because it is the code that 
specializes with the design of horizontal structures, especially highway and bridges. So the, the, the different design manuals, the different material related design codes that we have specified here on this discussion uh, deal, uh, deal mostly with building structural design. Most of them, most of the material related design codes that we have enumerated here deal uh, with uh, vertical structures, deal with building structural design. So therefore, although we must uh, still refer to them, but we just have to refer them for background information. So we, we must just use them as a reference and for background information only. So meaning we have to uh, mainly depend on the ASH to code whenever we design highway and bridge structures. So the, the different design manuals that we have enumerated here must just be used as reference and for background information only. Ash the code will still be the governing code that must be used in the design of highway and bridge structures because again it specializes uh, it, it specializes on horizontal structures while the different manuals or codes that we have specified uh, specializes on vertical uh, structures or building structural design. So those are the different design standards that we usually refer to whenever we design highway and bridge structures. But it's not, uh, it's not enough to be familiar with those different design standards. We have to also know how to use these design standards. It does not take one long to reach the disclaimer in a set of design standards like those listed here. Well, in a way, this may frustrate an engineer looking for the answer in a reference. It should also serve as a signal for the responsibility the engineer carries in any design. So just like what I'm saying, those design standards, it's, uh, it's not enough to be familiar with those design standards only. We have to know as well how to use this design standards because as we all know these design standards are just a guide for us to be able to design a highway or bridge structure so they they do not uh, guarantee success uh, in terms of the design but they are just giving a guide on how to design a particular highway or bridge structure that's why whenever you look on a particular design code, uh, you, you, can, you can notice that there is what we call a disclaimer such as this coming from the AASC uh, uh, structural uh, specification for structural steel buildings. There's actually a disclaimer uh, that can be found on AASC 360-05, the specification for structural structural steel buildings. So you can see here on this disclaimer and another, another disclaimer that can be seen on other design code that it was said here that while it is believed to be accurate, this information should not be used or relied upon for any specific application without competent professional examination and verification of its accuracy, suitability, and applicability by a licensed professional engineer, designer, or architect. So you, you can usually see this uh, kind of words, which are actually disclaimer for every design code or design standard that we refer to whenever we design a, a highway or bridge structure. So you can see here that the reference, or uh, should I say the the, the the reference to these uh, different design codes uh, do not guarantee absolute success to the design itself. It do not uh, they, they do not guarantee 100% uh, uh, safeness and quality with respect to the design. So they they. Uh, they uh, they are particular that the the whole responsibility for the design itself will still lie on the 
design professional that conducts the the design itself so you can you can uh, uh, easily see that uh, disclaimer uh, on every uh, design code this the, uh, this disclaimer are usually allocated uh, on uh, uh, sometimes on the preface or before the preface of any design code so you can see here that as a professional as an engineer we still have to be uh, the main responsible for the design that we carry so we have we don't have to we must not only refer to this design code design the de design standards that we have discussed blindly so we, we must not be a blind follower of this design standard we have to incorporate as well our engineering judgment whenever we refer this uh, whenever we refer to this design standards just like what we just like what uh, Salmon and Johnson said on their book, the steel structures design and behavior fifth edition. And may I just quote on section 1.7 of that book? Uh, it was said there that a specification containing a set of rules is intended to ensure safety. However, the designer must understand the behavior for which the rule applies. Otherwise, an absurd design may result either unsafe or grossly conservative. So you can see here on the code uh, or on, on my code from the book of Salmon and uh, Johnson that it is, uh, uh, it is being emphasized that the designer himself or herself must still be the, res uh, the, the responsible professional for the design that he or she uh, undertakes. So he or she must not uh, solely rely on what is being stated on the design standards that he or she uh, uh, is being uh, 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 referring to. So there must be uh, an engineering judgment that must always be incorporated on the design. Otherwise, the design may be absurd or unsafe or grossly conservative. So just that it's it's just the fact that uh, that uh, we we don't have to use the design standards as the absolute key for the for the success of our design. It the design standards do not guarantee the the safeness of our design. So it will still be uh, our our responsibility as a designer or or as a professional. Uh, to incorporate our own engineering judgment to know whether when 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 can we apply a particular provision a, on a particular standard so we have to incorporate our engineering judgment to know uh, their accuracy their suitability and, uh, and applicability because not all of the things that are stated on a design standard uh, are applicable to any case or scenario in a construction or design project so therefore there must be a human in human interve intervention or professional intervention so that we will not blindly follow the design standard itself the design should define the boundary conditions and the specifications should apply to those constraints not the other way around so aside from knowing that the design standards are just a guide therefore the the responsibility will still lie on the designer himself or herself aside from that we have to know as well that uh, design standards specifications are just a guide they they are they are not uh, they are not the one putting limitations to our design it should be our design that will specify the boundary conditions or limitations and not the specifications because some professionals uh, see specifications as a a set of standards that will limit design actually it's not that it's not that it's it's not the work of specification to limit or put a constraint on our design it's our design that must point that must put 
constraints or boundary conditions uh, on the design itself, not the specifications. It's it's not the other way around. It's not the specification that puts constraints or limitations to our design. The design should define the boundary conditions uh, itself. The bridge engineer should also think to question and improve upon reference design material whenever possible. There is still considerable room for improve it, uh, improvement. So aside from this, uh, these things that we have to know whenever we uh, use design standards aside from those, we, have, we, we should also think to question and improve always every design code that we use as a reference because we all know that these design codes as the disclaimers uh, manifest these design codes are not perfect so there are still considerable room for improvement and we cannot improve these design codes if we do not question the the particular provisions that we can see on this provisions so whenever we use this uh, uh, design codes as reference we must not just solely rely on it and believe on everything that are written on this uh, codes so we must question them as well question so that we can know how to improve these particular provisions of this uh, codes that we use as reference in our design so we must not be uh, we must not just 100% or fully rely on what is being stated on this design codes we must also help to improve uh, this this specifications uh, by questioning them in a good way so we have to question them in a good way not in a bad way so the purpose of the questioning must always be for the further improvement of the design code itself. So now let's just have a quick look back on how the different standards or specifications came into realization. So let us look what are the relationship between the, the specifications and the different bridge failures that happened in the past. For most bridge engineers, it seems that bridge, bridge specifications were always there, but that is not the case. The early bridges were built under a design build type of contract. The bridge company basically wrote its own specifications when describing the bridge it was proposing to build. As a result, depending on the integrity, education, and experience of the builder, some very good bridges were constructed, and at the same time, some very poor bridges were built. So, uh, today, uh, on this modern time, we design highway uh highway and bridge structures with the uh, guiding principles coming from the different design standards that we usually refer to but before in the past most bridge engineers uh, actually uh, build uh, highway and bridge structures without the aid or help of the specifications that uh, help us uh, to design and build today so on those uh, previous times uh, it was just solely a design build type of contract that is happening on those highway and bridge structure projects so when we say design build uh, type of contract there is solely a bridge company that will provide his uh, or their their own design if there is only a one company bridge company that will provide their own design and then there will also be the one to build the, the the design that they have made so therefore the different specifications for the design will obviously be coming from the bridge company uh, itself or should I say the builder itself so therefore 
uh, the specifications will solely base on the integrity, education, and experience of the builder himself because he is the one uh, who produces uh, their own specifications. So there is no design standards at that particular time before. There is no uh, design standards or design codes that were being used as a guide for designing and constructing bridge structures on that particular time. So the specifications will be uh, where we're just coming from the, the bridge company or the builder themselves. So therefore, there is no standard specification. Each builder will have their own specifications that will, uh, and the quality of that specification will, so, uh, will mainly depend on the integrity, education, and experience of the builder himself. Therefore, there are some very good bridges that were constructed and at the same time, there are very poor bridges that were built. Of the highway and railroad bridges built in the 1870s, one out of every four failed, a rate of 40 bridges per year. The public was losing confidence and did not feel safe when traveling across any bridge. Something had to be done to improve the standards by which bridges were designed and built. So because of that, since there is no standard way to design and construct bridges or highway, highway bridges uh, projects, uh, therefore, as a result of that, since there, are, there, there, there was no a standard for designing and constructing bridges, the result is having a, a bridge structure or bridge structures that have different quality. So some of them were uh, were, were uh, built or built uh, in a uh, with a with a high quality, and some were built with a not so good quality. That there, therefore resulting to some uh, bridge failures that happened in the past. So because of those uh, failures uh, happening on those bridges that were built by different specifications coming from the different builders, the public was losing confidence and and the design professionals at that particular time, the bridge engineers, felt that there is something that to be uh, that 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 needs to be done to to improve the standards by which bridges were designed and built. And as a result of that, on the on December 12, 1914, the American Association of State Highway Officials or AASHO was formed. And in 1921, its Committee on Bridges and Allied Structures was organized. The charge to this committee was the development of standard specifications for the design, materials, and construction of highway bridges. These spe specifications have been reissued periodically to reflect the ongoing research and development in concrete, steel, and wood structures. In 1963, the ASHO became the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or ASHTO. So this is the current logo of AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. So as you can see on their logo, they, they, they were uh, founded way back 1914. So before, the, the name of the organization was American Association of State Highway Officials or AASHTO. But later on, on 1963, the organization's name uh, was changed to Ashto. So the transport, the word transportation was incorporated to the to the name of the organization to emphasize that the organization is not only the governing organization for the specifications for the highway and bridge construction and design, as well as they are uh, the, the they, they also include the design and construction of all modes of transportation. So that is the reason why the word transportation is included or was included on their organization's name to emphasize that they are not only covering uh, highway, highway design and construction, like just like what their previous name manifested, but also they are also uh, covering all modes of 
transportation, not only highway, but also the other modes of transportation. Air, land, water, and railway transportation, not only highway, but all modes of transportation. So it's it's for it's for the uh, emphasis that they are the governing organization for all modes of transportation. So this is the organization form before to address the, the losing confidence of the public on the bridge structures that were built that were built on that particular time. So this organization was tasked to, to provide a standard specification for the design materials and construction of highway bridges. But then again, as their current name manifests, they are not only the governing body for highway only, but also on the other transport and on the other mode of transportation. So they became the solution to address the the, the problem of bridge failures that happened in the past. For railroad bridges, this task began in 1899 with the formation of the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association or AREM. So this is their logo. So their main task uh, already began way back before the ASHO were, were formed or was formed. So they were uh, tasked to address the problem for railroad bridges uh, way back 18. 99. So that is the AREMA. This is an organization that uh, that is mainly focused on railroad bridges. Specifications are constantly changing and adapting to new developments in the practice of bridge engineering. Just like what I've said before, the standard the standard specification that were published uh, by Ashto. Uh, were constantly updated periodically. So that update uh, is actually the result of new developments in the practice of bridge engineering. Although in some cases, new information on the performance of bridges was generated by a bridge failure. Several lessons have been learned from bridge, from bridge failures that have resulted in revisions to the standard specifications. So it's not only the risk, it's not only the new developments in the practice of bridge engineering. Uh, it's, uh, it's not only the new developments that were the reason for the revision of the standard specifications, but also. Uh, because new information can also be generated uh, from the uh, from the bridge failures that happened in the past. So aside from the new informations or new information that uh, can be generated from the research and development, uh, new new lessons as well can be generated from the lessons that we have learned from the uh, different bridge failures that happened in the past. So this new information that we have gathered from research and development and from the bridge failures that happened in the past uh, were incorporated to the standard specifications that were being published by the different organizations so that these bridge failures that happened in the past will not, uh, will not be happening again uh, uh, after after we already learned uh, after we already learned our lesson on that particular bridge failure after we have learned what what uh, what might be the cause of the failure of a certain bridge so the one of the most famous uh, bridge failure that happened in the past uh, was the uh, Tacoma bridge so this is the Tacoma bridge a bridge that uh, that wa that was not perfectly designed to to resist uh, swaying. So you, as you can see here on the on the GIF, the bridge was constantly swaying back and forth, even though there is no uh, vehicle load that is or that was traveling on it. So because of that uh, swaying, uh, it led to the eventual or sudden collapse of the Tokomi Bridge. 
So the, the lessons that we have learned from that particular bridge failure and other bridge failures that happened in the past were incorporated to our standard specifications. So revisions on those specifications were made so that the lessons that we have learned from the bridge failures that happened in the past uh, will be incorporated on them so that uh, we can we will not experience the same bridge failure again. Most of the memorable bridge failures and the ones that most affect bridge engineering practice have occurred in structures that were in service for many years. However, in service bridges are not the source of the most common occurrence of failures. Most failures occurring during construction uh, most failures occur during construction and are likely the most preventable kind of failure. So aside from the bridge failures that were experienced by those bridges that uh, were already standing for several uh, years, bridge failures al also occurred uh, during construction. So not only erected uh, bridges uh, experience failures, but also those bridges that are still uh, on construction stage. So those bridges that experience failure during construction, uh, again, gave us a very hard lesson that that provide, uh, provided us uh, new information to the uh, performance of bridges. So again, those lessons uh, were, were incorporated to our standard specifications so that we will not this we will not experience the same uh, the same failure uh, again on our uh, bridges that we uh, design presently or currently in the industry so as we can see there there are actually a relationship between the specifications that we are using right now and the different bridge failures that happened in the past. So these different, uh, these different bridge failures that happened in the past gave us new information about the performance of bridges. And this new information, together with the new informa information gathered or collected from the uh, new developments in the practice of bridge engineering, were incorporated on our standard specific specifications, thereby resulting to revisions of these uh, standard uh, specifications that we are using currently. So if you want to know more about the different specifications that came as a result of different bridge failures, you can refer to Chapter 2, Specifications and Bridge Failures, from the book of Parker and Pocket, entitled with the title, Design of Highway Bridges, 3rd edition. So we are now done addressing our second goal for this discussion, which is for you to be able to explain the different types of design standards. So we are now going to address our third goal, which is for you to be able to explain the importance of site inspection and side survey. So aside from knowing uh, the source of fund and the uh, design standards that will be used on a particular project, we also have to know uh, the importance of site inspection and site survey before commencing or starting the design and construction of a uh, particular project. So to be familiar with the importance of site inspection and site survey, we will now move on on addressing our third goal. So uh, the first question that we that will come into our mind is why do we conduct site inspection? So what what is the importance of site inspection? on the inception stage of every project. So there are three reasons uh, that we will enumerate here, particularly on the design and construction of a bridge uh, structure uh, that we usually, that are usually the reason why we conduct site inspection. So we will just enumerate some of the reasons here why we conduct 
site inspection. The first reason, uh, the first reason why we conduct site inspection uh, is because for the uh, for the construction of a new bridge structure. So this is one of the reasons why we conduct site, inspe site inspection for the construction of a new bridge structure. So there is no existing structure on the particular location and we will just be building a new bridge structure on that particular site. So why do we need to inspect the site first before we design and construct a new bridge there? So we need to uh, conduct site inspection there to inspect the geologic conditions, the highway alignment orientation, and underpass crossing features because these things can affect the the design and construction of a new bridge in a particular location. Thereby, uh, therefore, uh, they they are needed to to be inspected first and to know additional information about them first. So uh, because we uh, before we commence our uh, design and construction, so we need to uh, have a knowledge first about the geologic conditions, highway alignment, orientation, and underpass crossing features on the site before we, we will be able to construct a new bridge structure there. So that's one of the basic reason why we conduct site inspection. Another reason why we conduct site inspection is to observe and determine the present condition of an existing bridge, uh, existing bridge and site, and to, fulfill, and to fulfill standard requirements such as from National Bridge Inspection Standards or NBIS. So this is again another reason why we conduct site inspection. So this is actually for the case of an existing bridge. So for the first for the first reason we are uh, dealing with a new bridge structure, but for this second uh, reason we are dealing with an existing bridge. So we are conducting site inspection to assess the present condition of an existing bridge as well as to fulfill the standard requirements uh, from a certain standard such as the National Bridge Inspection Standards or NBIS. So we usually conduct uh, maintenance inspections or we, we also conduct uh, we also conduct a site inspection to, to rate a bridge structure and judge its condition and performance uh, which is more rapidly conducted than the other two with a principal intent of meeting standard requirements such as from the NBIS. And we also conduct site inspection to document the structure's condition and provide input data for the bridge management system or BMS and assist in the decision to maintain or rehabilitate the structure. So again, the second reason uh, why we conduct site inspection uh, is more of concern on, on the, an existing bridge and site. So we usually conduct site, site inspection to assess the condition of an existing uh, bridge site so that we, we will be able to decide whether to maintain it or rehabilitate it. And another reason is because it's actually a requirement from standards. So the, the different standards, whether international local or local standards, uh, require that we have to periodically inspect existing existing bridges and site so that uh, we will uh, we, we, we can have a knowledge on the present condition of that existing bridge so the main the main reason there is to assess uh, the whether the, the, the bridge is still in good service condition or not whether we need to to conduct maintenance uh, maintenance activities or we need to rehabilitate it already. So those are actually requirements from uh, some standards uh, such as NBIS, the National Bridge Inspection Standards. Another reason why we conduct site inspection is for the rehabilitation or replacement of a structure from an existing bridge and site. Inspection of existing structure elements to determine 
what needs simple maintenance and what needs extensive rehabilitation or replacement. So the third reason why we conduct site inspection is uh, somehow related to the second reason. So we conduct site inspection so uh, for 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 the rehabilitation or replacement of a structure from an existing bridge and site. So uh, in this uh, particular reason, there is an existing bridge that is already needed to be uh, rehabilitated or to be replaced. So before we start the rehabilitation or the replacement process, we have to inspect first the, the existing bridge to know which particular structural elements uh, uh, need to, to have simple maintenance or, or uh, which uh, particular structural element uh, needs extensive rehabilitation or replacement. So overall, we conduct site inspection because uh, we want to assess first an existing bridge uh, uh, on, on whether it needs a simple maintenance or it needs an, ex an extensive rehabilitation or replacement, as well as to know which particular structural elements uh, need uh, rehabilitation or replacement because some some bridges uh, are actually uh, uh, don't need total rehabilitation or replacement because uh, there are just some minor or, or some part, there are just some part of the existing bridge that uh, requires uh, rehabilitation or replacement. So therefore, there can be a simple maintenance that can be provided to the existing bridge uh, or, or if the assessment uh, tells that it needs extensive rehabilitation or replacement. Therefore, that is what the bridge engineer will provide. But before, again, before the bridge engineer starts the rehabilitation or, or replacement of a structure, he or she needs first to inspect the site. He or she needs first to inspect which particular element needs to have simple maintenance and which uh, needs extensive rehabilitation or replacement. A bridge inspection can fail if the inspector does not consider important site features such as drainage channels, drainage channels, wetland, embankments, utility lines, etc. and how they function within the confines of the bridge site. So it's very important that a knowledgeable inspector will conduct inspection for, for, uh, for the, uh, the development of a particular bridge structure because if the inspector is not knowledgeable about inspecting a particular site therefore there there can be what we call lapses that might be committed wherein the inspector will fail to to consider some important site features such as drainage channels with non embankment utility lines that may affect the new bridge structure or in the case of an existing bridge, it can affect the rehabilitation or replacement of an existing bridge. So therefore, uh, actually there there is there are some quali qualifications that must be met first uh, for a professional to be considered as an inspector. So these uh, qualifications are actually enumerated by the different standards that are applicable on a particular region. But then again, the, the whole site inspection process, uh, that I mean the success of the site, site inspection will uh, at some point uh, mainly depend on the one who conducts the inspection. Therefore, the inspector must have enough qualifications to consider everything, everything that is, uh, uh, that everything that can be uh, observed on the site itself that can affect the, the bridge structure itself. So if you want to know more about the different things, an inspector must check in inspecting a bridge structure and site. You can refer to section 2.3, site inspection of Tonya Senjiao, uh, their book, which is the Bridge Engineering, fourth edition.
So you can refer to the Bridge Engineering book for fourth edition by Tonya Sen and Zhao, Section 2.3 Site Inspection, if you want to know more about the particular things that an inspector uh, needs to check when inspecting a bridge structure. So aside from site inspection, another thing that we must conduct first before commencing the design and construction or rehabilitation of a bridge or highway project is the site survey. This is, so this is another uh, activity that we must uh, do first aside from site inspection before we can we can be we will before we can be able to design and construct or rehabilitate a particular project. So the question that will come into our mind is why do we need or why do we conduct site survey or in other words why do we need to to do site survey? So these are some of the reasons why we conduct site survey. Uh, we conduct site survey to create a model of topographic features that detail the surface of the overpass and underpass roadways as well as the surrounding site. Mm -hmm. Another reason is to why we conduct another reason why we conduct site survey is to create a model of delineate uh, wetland and buffer zones if they exist at the vicinity of the bridge site. Mm -hmm. Another reason is to create a model of planimetric features that detail various natural and human-made items such as culverts, utilities, railing, edge of pavement lines, vegetation, drop inlets, etc. And to create a model of water channel cross uh, water channel cross sections if the bridge crosses a waterway. And lastly, we conduct site survey to create a model of structural features that detail the location and elevation of bridge structure key points such as bridge seats, top of walls, and pylons in the case of a rehabilitation design. So technically, basically overall, we conduct site survey because we want to have a model of the actual site where we are planning to build our bridge or highway project such as this. So basically, we want to have a, a visualization, a visualization of the, of the things that we can observe uh, if we will be on the site itself. So we, 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 uh, we usually create a model of the of all the features that uh, that we can see on the construction site where the bridge can be where the bridge will be uh, built uh, by by conducting site survey. So in site survey, we we take uh, we usually take note of the topographic features that can be seen on the site itself. And as well as we usually take note of the uh, various natural and human-made items that can be seen on the construction site itself that may affect the design and construction of the bridge or highway projects such as culverts, utilities, railing, uh, edge of pavement lines, vegetation, drop in, etc. And for the case of for the case of a rehabilitation design, we may conduct site survey uh, to to have a to have the the detail uh, of the or the locations and elevations of the particular bridge structure key points such as bridge seats, top of walls, and pylons that are needed to be rehabilitated or may affect the reha the rehabilitation design. So overall, again, we conduct site survey to have a model of the actual site where we are planning to construct our bridge structure so that we can have a, a visualization of the actual site and all of the things all of the of the topographic features topographic features that we can see or we can encounter there as we conduct as, as we construct our bridge structure so we we can just uh, have a visualization of the actual site uh, if we will conduct a site surveys, if we will, if we will uh, conduct measurements and observations on the actual site itself, so that's another another 
another activity that we must first conduct before we, we will be able to design and construct a bridge or highway project. We have to survey the site first and take note of the topographic, planimetric, and structural features that can be found on it, which can affect the design and construction of highway bridge structures. So there, we already address our third goal for this discussion, which is for you to be able the, uh, to explain the importance of site inspection and site survey. So now we are down to our last goal for this discussion, which is for you to be able to explain the importance of physical testing and the different methods to conduct it. So without further ado, let us address our last goal for this discussion. So the last thing that we have to conduct first before we start our design or construction of a particular highway or bridge structure is to conduct physical testing. So now the question uh, is, why do we need to conduct physical testing? Why are we uh, required to perform physical testing? before starting a particular bridge structure or even on a rehabilitation of a of an existing structure why do we need to conduct physical testing that's the question that will come into our mind so we need to conduct physical testing uh, to supply needed information concerning the adequacy of materials used in the construction of the bridge. So that's the main purpose of physical testing, to have a knowledge on the strength of the materials that are being used in the construction of a bridge uh, project. So that's the main reason why we conduct physical testing. Although it's not, uh, it's not uh, limited to, to the construction of a new bridge, but it is we, we we also conduct physical testing to the to the existing bridges to know to have a knowledge on the present performance or or adequacy of the materials that are used as components of that particular existing bridge so overall we conduct physical testing to have a knowledge to have an information about the material that are used in the construction of a particular bridge or highway project. So there are actually different methods of physical testing. And the first one that we will study on this discussion is the coring uh, or the co coring or core testing. Coring is performed uh, when components of the bridge are to stay in place to ensure the adequacy of the material to remain. Structural core should be taken at key points in certain concrete elements such as piers in pier caps. So there, so the, the core must be located or collected from the pier caps uh, themselves in the case of piers and in the abutment stems for the case of abutments. And then after collecting those structural cores, Compression, compression, uh, compression tests are then performed at the testing laboratory to indicate the strength of the samples taken. For timber structures, cores are taken to determine the moisture content and the extent of decay within the timber element. So the first method of physical testing that we will study on this discussion is the coring. So this is actually the actual coring uh, procedure. So in as you can see here, this is actually the diamond core drilling procedure. Uh, as you can see on the GIF, uh, we, uh, we conduct uh, coring or we bore holes or we, dir we drill hole, uh, hole on the particular component of a bridge or any structure that we want to uh, uh, subject to core testing. So as you can see there, uh, we usually use a special equipment that, uh, that is used to core a hole or to drill a hole onto the concrete part of a structure. So again, we, we conduct that 
uh, physical testing, the coring, uh, to to ensure the adequacy of the material uh, to remain here. So usually we we conduct coring uh, for those bridge components that are needed to stay in place because obviously we cannot subject to uh, to compressive tests those uh, actual uh, bridge components that are already elected or that are already erect, erected on site obviously we cannot uh, subject them to compression tests so we just have to take some of its uh, component or some of its part some of its part and then uh, uh, take that core sample to the testing laboratory and subject it to compression tests for us to know the present uh, performance or present strength of, the, of that particular uh, component of the bridge structure. So that is uh, usually the, the whole process of coring. We, we core a hole or we drill a hole onto the particular bridge component and then that core sample will be taken to a laboratory, a testing laboratory, and will be subjected to compression tests so that the, the performance or the current strength of the whole component uh, will be known. So with that, we, ca we can have an idea on the adequacy of the whole component that remained on site. So technically, we are assuming that the strength that we will get from the from the core sample will represent the the strength of the whole component of the bridge structure. Although that's for the case only of concrete bridge components. So for the case of timber structures, we usually conduct core coring for the purpose of determining the moisture content of the timber structure as well as the extent of decay within the timber element. So again, just like what I've said before, uh, we we just we don't usually core holes on any part of a bridge component. We usually core holes or core uh, yeah we usually core holes on the bridge component on a particular key location. Like for example, on the case of piers, we just don't bore a hole or core a hole on the pier itself. We usually pour a hole on the pier cups. And for the case of abutments, we usually core a hole. We usually get a core sample from the abutment, abutment stems. So we don't just core a hole randomly. We usually core a hole. We usually get a core sample on key locations on the particular bridge component. So another method of physical testing is delamination testing. Delaminations are cracks that occur below the concrete surface, typically at the location of the upper reinforcing steel. So delaminations look something like this. So the de de delaminations uh, typically occur below the concrete surface and on the upper uh, part of the reinforcing steel. So in actual delaminations uh, look something like this. They actually occur beneath the concrete surface. So we, we, we can also see this in our home, on our floors and other concrete components of a particular uh, structure. So these uh, delaminations can actually affect, they can actually affect the strength of the particular component that, uh, that of that particular component where the delamination occurred. So they must be, uh, they must be detected uh, immediately so that proper uh, rehabilitation or maintenance can be provided to them so that uh, the, the effect of the delamination uh, will be reduced if, if not totally eliminated. The most basic method of testing is to use a hammer and sound for hollow spots. 
So in Actual, we usually locate the particular places where there are delaminations by using a hammer. We are we are using a hammer on the concrete uh, surface and uh, sound for hollow spots because this hollow spot sound can actually uh, manifest that there are actually delaminations beneath the concrete surface. So we usually tap the, the upper surface. We usually tap the surface of a concrete using a hammer and then uh, try to hear for uh, hollow spot sounds. So when, whenever we detect hollow spot sounds, it can manifest that there is there are already delaminations beneath the concrete surface. There, therefore, that particular location needs to be rehabilitated already. Obviously, such a method is quite, quite, uh, quite time consuming and for large surfaces such as decks can prove impractical. As an, as an alternative, a chain can be dragged along the deck surface to cover a greater area but surrounding noises may make it difficult to detect hollow sounds. So the, the use of hammer is obviously time consuming to detect the location of delaminations, especially if we are dealing with uh, large surfaces such as decks. So as, an, as an, an alternative to the use of hammer, we usually use a chain like this one and drag along the surface of the concrete so that we can easily detect for hollow spot sounds. So again, just like for the case of using a hammer, whenever we detect a hollow spot sound, that can manifest that the lamination already occurred beneath the concrete surface. So we usually mark that particular location where we detected a hollow spot sound and uh, record it so that it will be subjected to uh, maintenance or rehabilit re uh, rehabilitation. To facilitate the lamination detection, machines based on the acoustic method are available. Typically, it is walked by the inspector like a lawnmower or it is mounted onto a vehicle recording the laminations as it travels along the bridge deck. So as you can see here, the use of chains to detect the laminations uh, uh, can, can also be disadvantageous because uh, the surrounding, uh, surrounding noises coming from the vehicles traveling the, that particular highway or bridge can affect the detection of the hollow spot, hollow, hollow spot sounds. So therefore, it may, uh, it will make the detection process difficult for the uh, bridge engineer or the person conducting the uh, delamination testing. So as an, as an, as an alternative again to that uh, method, we can uh, use uh, delamination detection that are mainly based on uh, uh, the, the acoustic method wherein the inspector will just walk along the concrete surface, uh, a particular machine, which looks like a lawn mower, uh, or maybe it can also mount it onto a vehicle. Uh, and then as it travels along the, the highway or the concrete surface, it can already rec record the delaminations uh, as it travels along the bridge deck. So that's an, an alternative to the use of chains and hammer in detecting hollow spot sounds. Uh, infrared thermography is used to look for voids beneath the surface by measuring the temperature differential that exists due to the presence of moisture at a void. Ground penetrating radar, which can detect voids and delaminations in concrete, has also been used for concrete deck inspections. So these are more of mod modern technological advancement in the detection of uh, delaminations. So we can also use infrared thermography or ground penetrating radar to, to detect 
voids beneath the concrete surface because these voids can actually manifest that there are the laminations occurring beneath the concrete surface so if you if you will try to look on an infrared thermography this is just a small device like a camera like a camera that can can be used to detect the the temperature differential that exists due to the, the due to the presence of moisture at a void on a particular concrete surface there therefore uh, it helps to detect the location of delaminations so that is again another uh, method for uh, uh, physical testing the delamination testing so again uh, we usually conduct delamination testing to detect the location of the locations of delaminations or the cracks that occur below the concrete surface because these delaminations again can affect the strength of our concrete uh, component of our bridge or highway structure therefore it needs immediate action or attention and immediate detection and we can conduct delamination testing to immediately detect the locations of the laminations so another physical testing method that we usually conduct is the testing for cover so why do we need to test for cover it's because the chances for spoiling greatly increase when there is a uh, insufficient cover between the concrete surface and the reinforcing steel so when we say spalling spalling looks something like this so usually spalling happens because there is an in insufficient cover between the concrete surface and the reinforcing steel thereby increasing the chances of the concrete surface to spall out and expose the reinforcing steel beneath the concrete surface so usually that that uh, scenario happens because there there is no uh, sufficient cover between the concrete surface and the reinforcing steel so if you will refer to our uh, local codes or international codes like the ACI or the NSCP, uh, it uh, it is specified there the minimum concrete cover for different structural elements like for example for beams the minimum con minimum concrete cover specified by the code is 40 mm for the different structural elements there are other minimum required concrete cover to ensure that there is a sufficient uh, concrete cover between the concrete surface and the reinforcing steel for the purpose of protecting the reinforcing steel from uh, uh, external elements that may decrease its strength or that may corrode it like for example the uh, water water uh, uh, exposure or moisture exposure uh, is being prevented by the sufficient concrete cover to, to prevent the corrosion of the reinforcing steel beneath the concrete or embedded beneath the concrete so therefore uh, the, the concrete cover must uh, be tested and measured just to ensure that there is a uh, sufficient cover that may protect that that will protect the reinforcing steel embedded on the concrete uh, uh, structural element devices such as a pachometer can be used to determine the amount of cover present in an element while the pachometer determines the location of a reinforcing bar via a magnetic field other, met other methods are available that utilize ultrasound to locate the steel and to, de and to determine the concrete cover thickness. So devices such as pachometer or rebar scanner like this one or cover meter. So, so pachometer or, that is, or the particular device that is being used to measure uh, concrete cover thickness can come with many different names 
although these devices serve the same purpose, which is again to measure the concrete cover or the distance from the concrete surface to the extreme reinforcing steel. So that is the concrete cover that we are talking about. The distance or the space between the concrete surface and the uh, the edge of the uh, the reinforcing steel embedded beneath the concrete. So it it can come in this uh, form, like this one. This is, this is usually called a rebar scanner, uh, which uh, which uh, scans the, sur the concrete surface to scan the location of a uh, reinforcing steel embedded beneath the concrete surface, as well as the distance from the concrete surface to the uh, reinforcing steel embedded on, uh, on the concrete. So the the device actually works using the uh, the the magnetic field. So in that in this uh, particular GIF, you can see here that the device uh, uses the magnetic field to detect the location or the distance from the concrete surface from the device itself to the uh, to the reinforcing steel because as you all know, steel can be attracted by uh, uh, can be attracted to magnetic field. So that concept, that particular concept, is is being used to determine the distance from the concrete surface to the reinforcing steel, thereby uh, giving us an idea to the uh, specified concrete cover present on a particular structural element. So again, that is uh, one, one method of physical testing that we can conduct usually on existing structures to, to, to assess the condition of a particular structural element, especially the, the concrete cover present on that particular element. Because again, just, that, just like what I've said a while ago, uh, insufficient concrete cover may result to spalling, the spalling out of the concrete surface, therefore exposing the reinforcing steel. And we want, we usually want to avoid that scenario Therefore, we, we have to ensure that there there is an sufficient there there is a sufficient cover between the concrete surface and the reinforcing steel to greatly reduce the chance of spalling. Another physical test that we conduct to check the adequacy of materials is the measuring steel thickness. While a micrometer and or calipers can be used to determine, the, to determine flange and web thickness at the ends of members, the problem of picking up web readings along a stringer requires another method. One approach is to use an ultrasonic gauge like this one. The ultrasonic gauge, a handheld device about the size of a calculator, has a probe connected to it, uh, which, when placed on the steel, determines the thickness by sending ultrasonic waves to, through the steel. So, uh, the thickness of a particular steel component must be ensured and checked regularly to ensure that there, there is enough thickness uh, that is being provided by that uh, particular steel member or component uh, that that was used as a component of a particular bridge or, or bridge structure. So we can you uh, we can measure the thickness of that steel component using a micrometer or calipers. Although there are some instances where in the use of this uh, equipment or device or equipment. Uh, uh, can, can no longer provide the required measuring capability to, to, be, to be able to measure the thickness of a particular component of the steel member. Therefore, the, the, the use of ultrasonic gauges like this one must be uh, imposed. So this ultrasonic gauge uh, that you are seeing here uh, have a uh, purpose of measuring the thickness of a steel element, like what you are seeing here. You are seeing here that the 
the thickness of this particular hollow steel bar here is equivalent to 1.76. So you can see here that a probe connected to this device uh, is being used to measure the thickness, the actual thickness of that particular steel member. So the thickness is being measured by sending ultrasonic waves through the steel. And with that, uh, the, the thickness reading will be shown on this uh, uh, handheld device with a size of a calculator. So you can directly see the thickness of steel members uh, with just using this ultrasonic gauge. So this, uh, this handheld device is uh, advantageous to use for those steel members that cannot uh, readily be measured by micrometer or calipers like this one a hal if you want to measure the thickness of the of this hollow post uh, we cannot measure the thickness of the of this particular hollow post uh, hollow steel post here because obviously the use of micrometer micrometer or caliper uh, is not uh, uh, is not uh, available to be used to measure the thickness of this uh, hollow steel post. Therefore, the use of ultrasonic gauge will be needed. And as you can see here, we just put the probe on the steel post and then we, we uh, immediately uh, can read the actual thickness of the steel post, which is shown here, 0 0.503 inches. So, so in that way, we can assure that the the steel member uh, still has enough thick, uh, still has enough thickness to provide adequate strength to resist the uh, the loads that that are being carried by that particular steel member. Because as we all know, the strength of a material, especially a steel member, uh, uh, at some point uh, is based on its dimension or thickness. Therefore, adequate thickness must be provided always or adequate thickness must always be ensured, uh, always be ensured so that we, we can assure that our steel member can still provide resistance to the loads that are being carried by it. So again, that is another method of physical testing in, in it's uh, with the purpose of giving us an information about the strength of a particular steel member by measuring its uh, thickness to ensure that it still has a uh, enough thickness to provide resistance so the last method of physical testing that we will study on this discussion to be able to have an information about the adequacy of material is the detection of fatigue cracks. Unlike most structural failure mechanisms, fatigue failure offers almost no warning. A fatigue crack spends about 95% of its life growing slowly, almost dormant, and as a barely visible hairline crack. So, early detection is the key to prevent catastrophic structural failures. Once the crack passes the dormant period, it will develop rather rapidly, leaving little, little chance that bridge inspectors will detect it. So, on any structure, uh, some of its components uh, experiences what we call fatigue cracks. So these fatigue cracks are usually the result when a certain structural component experiences what we call cyclic loading or a repeated loading. So because of that cyclic or repeated loading, the structural component experiences fatigue that will result to fatigue cracks. So these fatigue cracks are actually not easy to detect because fatigue failure, which is the result of fatigue cracks, are, uh, offer, offers almost no warning because, as I've, said, uh, as I've mentioned, fatigue cracks are not 
easy to detect because fatigue cracks spends about 95% of its life growing slowly, almost dormant. So meaning uh, we cannot uh, have a signal to, to detect that there is already a fatigue crack that is being experienced by a structural component because usually it's barely a visible hairline crack. So we cannot detect it uh, immediately. And, as a, and as, a, as a result of that, if we cannot detect fatigue cracks immediately, they can grow uh, slowly uh, until such time that until it pass the dormant period wherein uh, it will uh, develop rather rapidly, leaving little chance that bridge inspectors will detect it. So we, uh, uh, if we cannot detect the fatigue cracks uh, immediately, uh, the result will be it will develop continuously until such time that it reaches a certain period wherein it will already develop rapidly and then will, re will result to the eventual failure of a particular component that experiences that fatigue cracks. So therefore, early detection of fatigue cracks uh, is important for us to, to prevent any sudden failure of our structural component, especially on bridge structures. Fatigue cracks should be inspected where stress concentrations or weld connections exist because most fatigue cracks are, are, are barely visible. Special dye penetrant may be used to assist in visual inspections. So usually fatigue cracks uh, occurs on those locations of stress concentrations or weld connections. That's why in actual, we usually conduct a series of tests on weld connections, most especially to detect to early uh, to detect early fatigue cracks. So in actual in the industry, we we usually use a simple method of detecting fatigue cracks, such as the dye penetrant test. So the dye penetrant test uh, looks something like this. So if this is a crack, a fatigue crack that is located on a certain structural component. Uh, we can use dye penetrant test to uh, to detect this particular uh, crack here because usually these cracks are just hairline cracks that are barely visible with the naked eye, meaning we cannot easily see these cracks underneath a particular structural component, especially on the on the uh, connections of uh, uh, welds. We, we cannot uh, easily see this fatigue cracks with our naked eye because there these are usually hair just a hairline crack so to uh, to assist or to aid us on inspecting uh, or detecting fatigue cracks we usually conduct dye penetrant tests wherein we spray a special uh, chemical or what we call the penetrant, usually color red, uh, on the surface where we want to detect the crack. And then after that, uh, we will leave the penetrant to dry there on the surface and then wash it with water until such time that the penetrants located on the surface of the uh, component will be washed away. And then a developer chemical uh, is also sprayed on the uh, surface of the structural component that we want to detect the fatigue crack until such time that the, the penetrant that penetrated the crack will, uh, will uh, show itself on the surface. So in actual, the dye penetrant or dye, dye penetration test uh, looks something like this. So we spray a red colored chemical called penetrant 
on the particular surface that we want to where we want to detect fatigue cracks and then again uh, add, uh, we wash it with uh, water we wash away the penetrants that are located on the surface and then after that we apply developer and then until such time that the penetrants that penetrated the crack uh, uh, emerge on the surface of the uh, structural component so one one example of an actual result of dye penetrant test is this so you can see here a small portion here you can see a uh, very thin hairline uh, crack that manifests that there is uh, an indication that a crack uh, already occurred on this particular part of the uh, welded connection that we have here. So that is one way to detect uh, cracks or fatigue cracks by the use of dye penetrant test. Again, in a dye penetrant test, we just spray a penetrant that will aid on the uh, visual inspection of the uh, the crack that is present on our structural component, but are barely detectable or visible with the naked. Uh, that's why we need to we need the assistance of the dye penetrant to 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 show the locations of the fatigue cracks. If fatigue cracks are suspected, other advanced methods such as X-ray, magnetic field disturbance, and ultrasonic tests can be used to detect any discontinuity in steel and thus detect fatigue cracks that might not be visible to naked eyes. So ultrasonic tests uh, look something like this. If you have a steel component here that has a discontinuity inside, meaning it has a cavity, there is a hole, say for example, inside the structural uh, component. And again, as we all know, uh, that particular cavity or hole can affect the strength of this steel component. So therefore, we have to detect early that there is uh, a cavity or a hole present on our steel component so that we can uh, do some preventive measures. So this is what an ultrasonic test uh, looks like. So what we do here is we apply a gel on the surface of the steel that we want to subject to ultrasonic test. And then we use a special device, which looks something like this, that sends sound waves or, or, or ultrasonic waves uh, along the steel member itself. So the waves will travel along the medium, along the steel component, and then every time it passes to uh, every time it passes a cavity, it will reflect a deviation on the connected monitor screen here. So as you can see here, as the sound waves or ultrasonic waves travel along the medium or the steel, every time it passes this cavity, you can see here a corresponding uh, deviation on the uh, graph of the sound wave being reflected on the computer monitor. So in that way, we can detect that there is actually a discontinuity present inside the steel member. Therefore, it can it will uh, force us to to provide preventive measures or maintenance or rehabilitation measures just to ensure that this particular steel component will still have an adequate strength to to serve its intended purpose. So those are just some of the physical testing that we usually conduct before commencing to the design or construction of a particular project. Or in the case of a, in the case of an existing bridge, we usually conduct this testing, physical testing, to for us to provide to provide us an information about the present or current uh, performance or behavior of our structural component, of our bridge structure. 
So there, we are already done addressing our last goal for this discussion, which is for you to be able to explain the importance of physical testing and the different methods to conduct it. So as a closing remark about our discussion, which is all about project inception, as evidenced by the preceding discussion, there are many factors of which the bridge engineer must be cognizant before he or she ever leaves a pencil in anger at a design pad. If bridge engineering teaches us anything as civil engineers, it should serve to, illustri to illustrate the dangers of excessive specialization. While there are solid arguments for, for professionals to seek a vertical arena of expertise, there are many compelling reasons for engineers in general and bridge engineers to be well-versed in all aspects of the engineering design and management processes. So as we have seen on this particular discussion all about project inception, we have seen that there are many things that we have to know first before we can commence the design and construction of a particular highway or bridge project. So we have seen there that uh, there are many things that are not actually within the scope of our, of our expertise that we still have to know first for us to be able to properly design and construct a highway or bridge project. Therefore, we must be well-versed in all aspects of the engineering design and management processes so that we can provide a uh, proper design of highway or bridge projects. Because if we will just limit ourselves on the knowledge of our expertise, there is an impending danger of excessive specialization. There is a danger of limiting yourself to, to some particular aspect of engineering. So we have to avoid excessive specialization. We have to avoid limiting our knowledge on what we are uh, doing only. So we must not limit our knowledge on our work uh, itself only, but we must extend our knowledge as well on those works that are not within the scope of our profession. So we must be well-versed in all aspects of the engineering design as we have seen on, the, on this discussion so that we can properly design and construct a highway or bridge project. The project inception, uh, the project inception phase is, for lack of a better term, an information gathering period. At the end of this phase, the design team should have most, if not all, of the information such as as-built plans and other record data necessary to create a sound and professional design of the new or rehabilitated structure. In addition, they should understand the owner's wishes and desires and how they impact the eventual design. So as you have seen on this discussion, the project inception phase is actually, a, uh, is actually an information gathering period wherein we are gathering several information that will help us to provide a sound and professional and so, a, to provide a sound and uh, professional design of the new or rehabilitated structure. So this information can come in many forms, such as the as-built plans. So when we say as-built plans, these are actually the plans of a particular project that are based on what are actually constructed in the uh, site. So this is, uh, this is different on the plans uh, that are uh, used as the basis of the construction of a particular project. As built plans uh, usually reflect the actual, uh, the actual uh, construction, the actual members that are constructed on the site. So it's uh, most of the time as built plans are different from the plans that are used as a basis on the construction because again as built plans reflect the actual construction of the project meaning it reflects 
the the things that you are seeing on the actual construction site. So the things that are actually constructed are just put on a plan, and that plan is what we call the as built plan. A plan that a plan that reflects what is actually constructed on the site. So that is uh, what as what an as built plans uh, uh, reflects or reflect. And then we we can we can also have uh, a record data. We can also gather a record data on project inception phase, which is a record of the history of a particular uh, bridge structure, like for example, a record of the different maintenance operations that uh, that was conducted on that particular uh, bridge that can aid or help us in the design of the rehabilitation of that particular structure. So usually we need this record data, the history of the particular structure to aid us in the design of the rehabilitation of that particular structure. So in general, again, the project inception phase uh, uh, helps, helps us, the bridge engineers, the designers, to to have a better understanding of what we are ga gonna what we are gonna do or what we are about to design and construct. So this phase gives us a lot of information that will assist and help us to to provide a sound and professional design of the new or a, re a rehabilitation uh, of a particular structure. So just to uh, summarize what we have discussed on this discussion, uh, for this discussion we have learned the five principal the five principal categories of fund source which are uh, user fees, non-user fees, special benefit fees, private financing, and debt financing. So these are the usual sources of fund to provide the needs for a particular transportation project. So the, so the fund can be can come in the form of a user fee or non-user fee or special benefit fee or a private financing or a debt financing. In this discussion, we also learned the different types of design standards that we usually refer to whenever we design or construct a bridge or highway project. So these design standards are usually the general specifications and the material related design codes. So we usually refer to these design standards uh, as our guide, not, not as a limitation, but as our guide for our design process. Another thing that we have learned in this discussion is the importance of site inspection. So we have learned that we we conduct site inspection for the construction of a new bridge structure to observe and determine the present condition of an existing bridge and site and to fulfill standard requirements such as from National Bridge Inspection uh, Standards or NBIS and for the rehabilitation or replacement of a structure from an existing bridge and site. So we have learned that these are some of the reasons why we conduct site inspection to have an information about uh, the, the things that we, that we have to know for the construction of a new bridge structure and to assess the present condition of an existing bridge and as well as to, to know which particular component of a bridge uh, that needs to be rehabilitated or to be replaced. Another thing that we have learned on this discussion is the importance of site survey. So why do we need to conduct site survey? We usually conduct site survey to create a model of topographic features, to create a model of planimetric features, and to create a model of structural features or in general we conduct site survey to have a model of the actual uh, site where we are planning to construct our bridge so that we, we can have a visualization of the actual site where we are where, where we are planning to 
build our structure. So that's the reason why we conduct site survey to, to have actual measurements or to have an actual visualization or a model of the actual site where the project will be built. Lastly, we have learned the importance of physical testing before commencing a design or construction as well as to, to know the present condition of an existing bridge component. So we conduct physical testing to supply needed information concerning the adequacy of materials used in the construction of the bridge. So that's the main purpose of physical testing, to have a knowledge on the present condition of a material use in the construction of the bridge, to have an information concerning its adequacy. So there are different methods of physical testing that we have studied on this discussion, which are coring, uh, the, the delamination testing, testing for cover, measuring steel thickness, and lastly, detecting fatigue cracks. So these are the common physical testing that we usually conduct to have an idea on the uh, adequacy of the materials used in the construction of a bridge. So that's all for this discussion. Thank you for listening. For questions, clarifications, and any other concern, please do not hesitate to contact me via inbox in, in your canvas, or you can message me via messenger, just search my name, Adam Suresanyo Nuevo Junisio, or you can email me at my email at arjunisio.ce at tip.edu.ph. So that's all for this meeting. Thank you for listening.